next week, you can stay in bed longer. Well, actually, that's not true. Because to stay in bed longer, you have to go to bed at an early hour instead of, because we're turning the clocks back. So, but we will still be here at the proper time at 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11. So we hope to see you then. So I just give you that reminder. Also, we had a little bit of a problem. We took our surveys on worship, and we found that the 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock people and the choir were very good at filling out their surveys. But we were lacking with the 930 people. So we need your help on this because we're trying to, to assist the Sunday school uh, with being able to find out how we can best arrange to be able to provide for the education of our children. So you'll find that there are surveys that are available. And if you look for Bill Sanford at the back door, Kay Phillips by the side door, and surely more Crackheart in the Fellowship Hall, they'd be glad to give you a survey and to take it from you, 930 folks. <laughs> Very good. That's the most I'll scold you. Our introit this morning is a congregational introit. I was asking the choir to do it. But it is number 328, Surely the Presence of the Lord. Let's sing it together. Please sit with gusto. <laughs> Let us join together in our call to worship. What the Lord your God asks of you is to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love God, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So let us enter into this time of worship with holy fear. But isn't God love? There should be no fear in love, for perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with the punishment. We are people who know the grace of Christ. We have nothing to fear from God. The person who fears the Lord shall be shown the path they should choose. They shall enjoy lasting prosperity, and their children shall inherit the land. The Lord confides his purposes to those who fear God, and God's covenant is theirs to know. So we shall continue to work out our Let us try to persuade all people to fear the Lord, for we know we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due them for what they have done in life, whether good or bad. Let us pray together. God, we are grateful to you, for though you are just, your justice is tempered by love. We celebrate this abiding truth, for only by facing the hard facts of our evil are we truly free from fear of judgment and free to live the abundant life you desire for us. We know there are so many trapped in their sin who fear you and their fear keeps them from drawing close because they know subconsciously what they deserve. To pray and to worship only reminds them how deficient their lives are. May our grace-filled worship display the truth of your love and power to transform life into the beautiful life that they know and celebrate with us. We are so desperate for a fresh 
fresh awareness of your presence and acceptance for us. We are grateful that you are our Savior, our Lord, and our friend. Amen. We have a processional hymn this morning because we have a procession of our Discovery Zone children in costumes that they may be wearing on Halloween. So let us sing our processional hymn number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. some really good costumes here today. I'm pretty sure that you're Minnie Mouse and you're a bunny. And let's see. Oh, there's a police officer with handcuffs. Oh, I better be good. And there's a candy corn witch. And there's a snowman. And are you a boy? Oh, you're Olaf from Frozen? Oh, who else is here from Frozen? I thought so. Very good. And who are you from Frozen? Anna. Anna? And who are you from Frozen? Anna. Anna? And you're Anna too? Anna had so many costume changes. Wow, very nice. Does anyone else want to tell me what their costume is? Okay, what's yours? Batgirl. Batgirl. You're an angel. You're a fortune teller. And you are a king. And we have Mother Mary and baby Zachary over there. <laughs> oh, oh, is he dressed up as baby Jesus? He's dressed in swaddling bands, yes. You are Lydia, dressed in purple. And, I'm and there's a bunch of grapes over here. Oh my goodness, what fun is that? Oh, did I forget somebody? Who's okay. that? Dominique. Dominique? Ninja Turtle, very good, very good. Well, do you know, even when you're dressed up like someone that you're not, 
God knows who you really are on the inside? Did you know that? That there's one person that we can't hide from, and that's God. That God knows who you are on the inside and loves you very much. In fact, the Bible said God knows how many hairs are on your head. I haven't counted all the hairs on my head. Have you counted all the hairs on your head? Not even close. But God knows even that about you. Sometimes on Halloween we talk about being scared, right? Does anybody have a scary costume? Yeah? What's a scary costume? A vampire. Witch. Or a witch. Some witches are scary. Some witches are nice, right? What else? Ooh, there was a scary bee last time. This one is scary. This is a scary witch? Okay. Not too scary. Yes. Well, today, Pastor B is going to be talking about the fear of the Lord. And can you show me a scared face? Can anybody make a scared face? Oh, those are good scary faces. Okay. So, but the fear of the Lord is a different kind of fear. It's not fear of being scared, like of a witch or a vampire or a bee that could sting you. It's about recognizing how big God is. Do you ever think about how big all the stars in the universe are? Or solar systems and planets? Can you imagine that God made all of that and knows about all those stars and all their names, just like Hi. knowing? Hi, Ben. <laughs> Just like knowing all the hairs on your head. He probably knows more about you than you know about you. That's right, Anthony. Pretty cool, huh? And that's a good reason for staying in touch with God and learning more about yourself from God, too. So let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you so much for loving us, for knowing our names, and for fun times together like dressing up for holidays. Please be with us as we go trick-or-treating if we do that, or at the Harvest Festival this afternoon. Please be with us and help us to get to know others and to get to know ourselves. But most of all, to get to know you. As they say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We pray in your name. Amen. You can go to Discovery Zone. Thank you so much for coming in and for sharing your costumes with us. That was really neat. I'm going to be honest, that was really sparkly as I think that plays music on her costume. Really?
to go to God in prayer. Let us sing together our call to prayer. Lead me, Lord. of God, I invite you to join me in an attitude of prayer as I share the words of lay servant Judy Lieber Butler. Please join your hearts and minds with my words as we come before God in prayer. Lord, we are your people. Today we have gathered here to praise you, to thank you and to listen for your word to us. We praise you today for the season of fall. For many of us, it is the best season. Fall gives us relief from the hot summer, harvests of food, and brilliant colors to enjoy before the winter. We are so thankful, Father, that you created trees. We are in such awe as we watch their transformation from everyday green to glorious colors of rich reds, brilliant oranges, and golden yellows. And to think, you created this process just for us. We are so elated that you are our creator. Thank you so much for the splendor of fall it is wonderful. While we enjoy the beautiful things you give us, we are also reminded of the unattractiveness present in our world. Many of your children cannot see the beauty right now. Some children carry around such heavy loads. May we lift your children, the children of God, up today and help relieve their burdens. We lift up your children struggling from loneliness, divorce, grief, addiction, depression, unemployment, hunger, and homelessness. We offer their names in our hearts. You know the needs, Lord. Send solutions and the people needed to help them. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear the help that you are sending to them and the courage to reach out and accept it. We pray for those with injuries and illnesses, particularly those who have cancer, and their families as well. It seems everywhere we turn, Lord, there's a neighbor or a co-worker or a friend or family member who have their lives affected by cancer. Please help medical professionals find improved treatments and better yet, find the cause or find a cure so that we can prevent it. We pray today also for the medical angels that are treating your children who have Ebola. May you provide them with your protective shield and ease their feeling of treating, ease their fears of treating those who have the virus. We ask for continued protection of all in harm's way, including our police officers, 
Homeland Security Special Agents, and our military sisters and brothers. May the armor of God always be with them every minute of every day. And finally, we pray today that peace will be found and the unrest everywhere in the world will be extinguished. Then everyone will be able to see the brilliance of fall and praise you, our creator, together as one family. Hear this, the prayer of your children. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? As you saw the children presenting themselves in their costumes, we have an opportunity to present ourselves to God, not in a costume, but in that way that suits us best. And I invite you during this time of offering to share not only your tithes and financial offerings, but also if you have one of those surveys that indicates times that would work best for you for worship, or the one that talks about how, what gifts you might like to use in service to your church and community, to put that also in the offering plate. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gifts you give us. Please make us generous givers. Amen.
gracious God, thank you for these gifts and for those who have given them. We ask your blessings upon them that they may help cast out fear everywhere in the world. Help us to be the ones who bear the message of your love to all we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now I invite you to turn and greet your neighbor. Recognize Christ's presence in them. The peace of Christ be with you. to us from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, beginning at verse 18. Listen for the word of God. You haven't drawn near to something that can be touched, a burning fire, darkness, shadow, a whirlwind, a blast of a trumpet, and a sound of words that made the ones who heard it beg that there wouldn't be one more word. They couldn't stand the command. Even if a wild animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so frightening that Moses said, I'm terrified and shaking. But you have drawn near to Mount Zion the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, to countless angels in a festival gathering, to the assembly of the God's firstborn children who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than Abel's blood. 
See to it that you don't resist the one who is speaking. If the people didn't escape when they refused to listen to the one who warned them on earth, how will we escape if we reject the one who is warning from heaven? His voice shook the earth then, but now he has made a promise. Still once more, I will shake not only the earth, but heaven also. The words still once more reveal the removal of what is shaken, the things that are part of this creation, so that what isn't shaken will remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken, let's continue to express our gratitude. With this gratitude, let's serve in a way that is pleasing to God with respect and awe because our God really is a consuming fire. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to jump ahead to the questions of life and faith so you can think on those as we sing together. Why is it that people say they believe in God but choose not to worship? Why do we avoid the fear of God in Scripture? How can we fear God and love God at the same time? Our hymn is number 378, Amazing Grace. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 6. See the children come through in costume to us this morning. I know that my wife and I have been looking forward to, to living where we are because for the past two places where we resided in our ministry, we didn't have the opportunity of having many visitors on Halloween. In Pulaski, we were about a quarter mile outside of town and people would bring their children into downtown in order to do their trick-or-treating. and. When we lived in Cortland, uh, we were on a 34-acre campus, and people just didn't come out our way to be able to go trick-or-treating. And so we look forward to being able to see all those little urchins coming by. It's beautiful to see what they do. It reminds me of when my children were growing up. We oftentimes, they just went to certain church members' homes to be able to trick-or-treat, but we'd always have, just like we are this Sunday, today, in the afternoon, we'd have a harvest party. 
And I remember one occasion in which we were first new in Rochester, and there was a couple that our kids came to call Grandma and Grandpa Hoffman, Dee and Don Hoffman. Now, Don took everything to a dramatic level. He's a wonderful guy. He dressed up like Frank Frankenstein. And dressing up like Frankenstein, you couldn't tell it was Don at all. I mean, I don't know how he made this costume with these thick boots and how he squared off his head and made it the color it was and such. But we were new, and our children were young. And so he was going to surprise everyone by coming down this hallway and breaking into the party. So his wife, Dee, who our children still lovingly call Grandma Dee, she decided she wanted to prepare our kids as they were coming over from the house adjacent to the church so they wouldn't be fearful. So she drove down our driveway as the kids were coming out and going over to church and then proceeded to open up her window. In opening up that window, she realized the kids wouldn't realize who she was, so she shone a flashlight on her face which meant that the kids couldn't see who she was anyways. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we're in the fellowship hall, and there comes my children, screaming. <laughs> they went right by Frankenstein, weren't scared of Frankenstein at all. And said so they broke in, said, there's this crazy woman out in the car. <laughs> you know, as I think about Halloween, and you know, some of the costumes, they're different. Some are of angels. Some of, of them are superheroes. Uh, some of them are of witches and, and maybe of some creatures like vampires or, or of other evil things that we hear about and usually associate with Halloween. And you wonder why it is that we've chosen to, to lift up those things that a lot of people fear. We also look at TV and movies, and it seems that we have a preoccupation with fear. People love to go get scared. Did you ever reason, wonder why that was the case? Why do we like to be frightened so much? I mean, there's other things in life that we really, truly need to be frightened of. There's war and violence, far away and near. There's so much tragedy around us that why all of a sudden do we like to be frightened for the moment? There may be many reasons, but I think that one of those reasons is that if we are able to laugh at certain fears, we will not fear them. There are things that people used in past to cause fear and control people, but all of a sudden, when we laugh at those fears, even if you would the fear of death for Christians, we don't have to fear death. We might fear the way that we're going to die, but we don't fear death, or we shouldn't, because of our faith in Jesus Christ and the promises that Christ has given to us. But for the world, I think that we like to avoid our fears by maybe desensitizing ourselves to those fears. And that leads me to think of the question is, why do people avoid worship? You don't, you're here. But in the world, we understand that over between 88 to 92% of people profess faith in God or belief in God. But only 34% practice worship at any given opportunity. 34%. That's a big discrepancy. Why is there that they don't want to worship? I, in thinking about that, there are many good reasons that I could cite. But one of those things is, I believe, to avoid the fear of God. Many will say, I don't like the God of the Old Testament, the God of vengeance, the God of anger. And that is true. We read of God's vengeance and anger in the Old Testament. They say, rather, I like the God of Jesus. Because Jesus was grace and 
patience, and gentle. However, they also neglect certain other things about Jesus, from his getting angry and turning over the temple, the, the tables at the temple. They forget that Jesus actually closed up the loopholes and made following God even more difficult. And it's one of the reasons he was so threatening with what he taught that it drove people to, the, particularly the religious authorities, to lead him to his execution. Jesus was a frightening and threatening figure for many. We forget that he also spoke in Luke. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now, that is not a light and gentle thing to say. And we don't talk much about hell in the church today. It's just not politically correct. We like to present God as a gentle, loving, wonderful character because we know through Jesus Christ who extended grace to us. We try to avoid anything that has real fear to it. And we tend to think and focus upon those passages that relieve us of those fears. For instance, Jesus in, recorded in John 15 says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everyone that I've, everything that I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. And so we sing that hymn this morning. What a friend we have in Jesus. How can we be frightened of such a friend? Even though it also says in scriptures that it is Jesus that God has entrusted judgment to and that we will all stand, whether we are people of faith or not, before the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe it's because of who Christ is that we know the gentleness of Christ and perhaps that Jesus is going to let us off. That's what we believe. Then there's John who writes in another letter, 1 John. He says, God is love. If God is love, that's totally different than the God that we see reflected in the Old Testament. Except I would take issue of that because I can also see the God of love in the Old Testament. The God who cared. The God who sought after a people. The God who even came to the point of becoming flesh in offering himself for us. But here, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are to be like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. The problem I have with that passage where it talks about, oh, if we're just love and everyone loves someone, we can sing that. Everybody loves somebody sometime. We all have people that we love, but if we really search in our hearts, we really dig down deep, we will know that our love is not, per is not perfect. It is selective. It is not like the love that God has shown to us that covers all people and desires the best for all people. We are selective in our loving and imperfect in our loving. I don't know about you, but when I first came to renew my, my faith in Christ, it was with great fear for my soul. I remember wandering down the pathway at college, a Christian college, and being raised in the Christian faith. But in my wandering that, that particular night, with seeing all the choices I had made, and some of those choices I made, evil choices I made, while believing in God and in Jesus Christ. I made them because I felt that God would forgive me. But then all of a sudden, 
the consequences of my sin started falling upon my life. And all of a sudden, I had to struggle with that fear within me. Oh, my soul was in jeopardy. My soul was in jeopardy. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch deserving of judgment that I am. And so it was in the context of that fear that I recommitted my life to Christ. Maybe that's happened to you, or maybe it's yet to happen for you. But it is in the course of time of companionship with my Savior, my God, all of a sudden, as that hymn so says, it was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. I am thankful that I came to a fear of God because that by that same fear it led me into the embrace of my Savior. And through relationship with my Savior relieved me of my fear. For as John says, perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Some people fear, fear, find that fear if, of God is a reverent awe, a holy sense of wonder and divine wow. But is this true? Is this fear of God just that which says, oh man, God, you are awesome. Look what you do, God. And yes, that is true. And I stand in awesome wonder of what God can do. And I stand in awesome wonder of what God will yet do because I see what God does in life today. But there is there more to that fear? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, so Proverbs tells us. And knowledge of the Holy One is where understanding really begins. Jeremiah says, should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? In Hebrew, there are three words for, for fear. The fear as we know as fear, terror, and dread. Yira, Yara, and Pachad. There are other words in Hebrew for mere respect, reverence, and honor such as kabod. In Greek, which also our Bible is written in, is fear or terror is known in the word phobo, from which we get our contemporary word phobias. And there's also reverence and honor, a different type of fear that is called timeo. And timeo, we might get that word timid from. But being timid is different than having fear, a fear. This distinction, I bring these words up not because they're impressive, but because it's important to see there's a distinction between fear and fear. Why is it we will not accept the fear of God? Why do we try to explain away the fear of God that we find in Scripture? Why is it that a world does not worship because it fears God? And if it had a fear of God, well, how would our world be different? Some would say that one of the problems in our world is that we have lost a fear of God. Listen to what Mike Iaconelli, a American theologian, writes about this. He says, we have defanged the tiger of truth. We have tamed the lion. The tragedy of modern faith is that we no longer are capable of being terrified. I would like to suggest that the church become a place of terror again. Now listen to what he says. A place where God continually has to tell us, fear not. A place where our relationship with God is not a simple belief or a doctrine or a theology. 
It is God's burning presence in our lives. Yeah. I am suggesting Woo. that the tame God of relevance be replaced by the God whose very presence shatters our egos into dust, burns our sin into ashes, and strips us naked to reveal the real person within. The church needs to become a glorious, dangerous place where nothing is safe in God's presence except us because of grace. Nothing including our plans, our agendas, our priorities, our politics, our money, our security, our comfort, our possessions, our needs. Ouch. A restoring of an appropriate fear of God. Now we turn to Hebrews, which is a wonderful, wonderful passage. Because here I find that the author of Hebrew, Hebrews discusses the fear of God. In verse 18, listen to what it says, You have not come to a physical mountain, a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the people of God did at Mount Sinai. Can you remember back to that experience? where the people appeared at the base of Mount Sinai and they were so fearful that only Moses went up. And even as Moses went up to get the word of God, when he came down, because of the holiness of God, his very countenance changed. Not only his appearance, but countenance means more than appearance. Countenance means our very attitude of heart, of life, was transformed by fear. He goes on to describe that, how even Moses was fearful. And it says here that they came to a place in which it was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. And even Moses himself said, was so frightened at the sight that he said, I'm terrified and trembling. Have you ever been terrified and trembling before God? And then, the author of Hebrews goes on to say something that's more relieving for us. No, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Now, the image of the city is very important. It's different from a mountain. A mountain can be fearful to climb, to get to the top, not knowing what dangers might be there. A city, though, in the image here, is that which is a collection of people, a community. And there's only community when there's no reason to fear one another. And there's no reason to fear one another because there's a fear of God. You've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children when we come here today. Do you realize that you're gathering with others of faith, that you are the gathering of God's firstborn children. God's children, whose names are written in heaven. The youth, yesterday, we went on a grave digging excursion. No, we didn't dig up any bodies. There was a scavenger hunt in the cemetery where they had to identify, go through as a race to find, in so many minutes, different things on tombstones a person that was closest to their age who died, a child, the youngest child who died, the oldest person who died. Also, the strange names of people who died, and we talked about those names, and you realize even though they named off the, in our debriefing those different names, I reminded them that most of those persons have been forgotten, dead, long gone. And their names may seem strange to us. And they may be forgotten by us. But there is a God who made them, who loved them, and who knows them by name and calls them by name, just as God calls you by name and knows you by name. Thank God. We have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. See, that's the secret of holy fear. 
We are not perfect right now. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Far from it. If we are in fear, then we understand who we really are. And there's no one, no one who could stand in our midst and say, oh, if only that person was like me or like me. Because if we have a fear of God, we understand there is no rightful reason we could stand before a holy God unless God made it so. We have come before a God who will judge us as persons who are not now perfect, but as this word says, will be made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people, to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Thank God we understand through Jesus his offering of forgiveness of grace. Because it is fear, that grace that caused my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. And so it's only because we know in our companionship, God, what it is to fear God. And it's just like with my father or my grandfather or other persons that I've known that I, that had, I had a respect for. I realized there are many times my father would have to follow through, and I as a father would have to follow through on some consequences. I remember those fateful words, this is going to hurt me more than it does you. I don't necessarily believe it was so. I still felt the pain of it. But what I really came to fear, because of the love that those who had authority over me had, was the fear of disappointing those who showed such, so much love for me. I didn't want my father or my mother to see me fail because they loved me so much and they deserved the best that I could be and the best that I could give. And it's the same thing with God. So here's something for us to the fear that we should have as people to follow God, people who follow Christ. As we come to worship, I hope and pray you also are reminded every day of what you should fear. It says in verse 25, be careful that you do not refuse the, to listen to the one who is speaking. Not me, but to God. For if the people of God did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, will we certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven? When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. He goes on to say, but God is going to shake the earth and the heavens once more. And since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable by fear, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Let us worship God with holy fear and awe. I always pray that whenever I come to worship, as I have morning prayer that I'm shaking in my boots. Not fearful of you. I don't fear you. But I shake in my spirit because I, want, I know who it is that I represent by what I say and what I do. And that causes me to fear. When we come into worship, the heart of worship, is there that sense of holy fear? that we bring our lives and we realize our own imperfections, our desperate need for grace, and the wonderful gift that God has given to us in the grace, so that even in our costumes that we wear, we don't have to be afraid. What True fear is. The fear of God is respect for the one who loves us and shows us grace, but who cannot excuse or save us from the consequences of our own choosing. So be careful, so the word says, that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. The greatest visible evidence of the fear of God is obedience to God came to a point in my life where I feared because I professed a belief, but 
that belief wasn't translated into truly responding to the offer of grace with obedience. The fear of God is freedom. Freedom from fear of judgment. Freedom from the chains in life that bind us. Freedom to live in companionship, continual companionship, with Jesus who loves us. Freedom to not be fearful of what the world fears, but to overcome the fear of this world with the faith of Christ who takes away all our fears when we follow. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we thank you for your gift of love to us. We admit that we take worship for granted. We come and do our duty, but we are not really shaken. We are not shaken in our heart, our spirit. We are not moved. It's not because of anything that happens, but it's, hap- it's because of the lack of something happening within us. Restore to us that holy sense of awe and fear that makes us shake, that makes us come in the awareness of all our need before you. And in this time of worship, in this place with others who also fear, may we find our fears relieved because of the grace that we find here through your word, through our worship, through the love and acceptance that we give to one another. Restore that wonder, that mystery to our worship. For there are others who so desperately need the fear of God so that fear may be lost. Our world is longing to see whose God is big and holy and frightening and gentle and tender. And ours, a God whose love frightens us into his strong and powerful arms where Jesus longs to whisper those terrifying words, I love you. We ask this in the name of that one who speaks those loving words, Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us that in our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Church, if you are able, and even if you're not able, you can stand with your heart inside and sing our praise to God. To God be the glory. Great things God has done. So loved God the world that God gave his own son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in.
Jesus, a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. For fear is about punishment, and we are not going to be punished, but to cast out others' fear as we celebrate the greatness of our God. Go now in peace in the name of the one Jesus called Abba, Father, in the name of the one who called Jesus my beloved child and calls you God's own child, in the name of the Holy Spirit who calls to each of us. Go in peace. have pancakes and have a good and godly day. <laughs>